Please listen carefully. Welcome to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast from CityWorks Expo. My name is Brad Stevens, and I'll be your host today, and it's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to our guest today, uh, Christian Jeffers, who you may know as the Black Urbanist. How are you doing today, Kristen? I'm doing great. This is really exciting. I'm really looking forward to chatting with you today. Well, yeah, we had you down here in Roanoke last year, and I'm always glad to have an excuse to have people down here to Roanoke. So I hope you had a good time, and we're certainly uh, thrilled to have you back on the podcast today. Oh, yeah, Roanoke was such a fun place to be. It has been my second time in Roanoke. Both times I've come for CityWorks Expo, and, of course, this time I was able to be on the main stage, which is a lot of fun. Well, wonderful. And and so now you've been, like, you're obviously, you know, your a lot of your work has been around this black urbanism theme. And I wonder if you uh, can tell me a, a bit about how you define what you do and, and what you've been up to uh, with that kind of work. So really, it, the roots of it started in my childhood in Greensboro, North Carolina. And, you know, growing up in a southern small city, growing up in a city that has a it's sort of a, a pinpoint in the greater civil rights history of this country and still seeing where there are ways we can improve on how we relate to people. I, I'm an only child, and my parents uh, definitely doted on me. Even though we weren't like a wealthy family, they made sure that I was going to the library in the summers, and I knew how to navigate on the map, and, you know, faith was a big part of our lives because the community comes in being part of a faith community. And just, you know, the, my Southern food taste, you know, there was introduction of that between their their parents and their siblings, and they have, both of them have many siblings, and so I have a lot of first and second cousins that I leaned on as siblings growing up, and before my parents split, um, our backyard was a central location for people to kind of hang out at, so I had a lot of backyard friends growing up, you know, my cousins would come over on occasion. So, you know, that was that was the root of my work, just the feeling of community and family that started within my, my home life. And then also just the way that Greensboro gathers as a community when we do our community festivals. Uh, when I was growing up in the, uh, really in the 1990s and into the early aughts, you know, the street festivals. We still do fun fork every year and we also had a city stage and festival of lights and just these times when people from all walks of life were invited and welcomed at street festivals. Uh, and unfortunately there have been times in the, in the near uh, recent past that, you know, there have been issues where, you know, people have come and there's been, you know, just a lot of just Sometimes bad things that happen, but ultimately, 99% of the time, you see people from all different races, ethnicities, cultures, income levels, who come together and have a positive experience and exchange cultural, and it come together as friends. And but you, you still, I still have to acknowledge and address the fact that sometimes we have people who don't trust each other. Sometimes we, we do spend money on things that as a community and also as ourselves that don't necessarily get us where we need to go. We feel like we have to be ashamed of the things that make us who we are, whether it's, you know, in some cases, Southern accents or, you know, just certain forms of culture expression. And I, I hate that because there's a positive and negative to everything. And I think if we spent more time on the positive that we would do a lot better. And if we actually looked at the negative critically and looked at uh, suitable solutions. So essentially I come at the process of urbanism, which I see as creating a, a broader community together from a policy perspective. I come from it from a building perspective in that, yes, there are things that you can build into your communities and things that you build in that aren't, aren't very helpful, such as like you benches that don't have backs or benches that make you hot if you sit there too long in the sun or things that we do that don't necessarily help communities that rely on those benches just to have a humane place to sit when they don't have anything else for them. So it, I, I definitely want to, in my work to uh, be inclusive, to think outside of the box, challenge uh, established thoughts, 
But at the end of the day, if at all possible, we can all sit down and we can break bread together, much like we do at Southerners. But we, there's still some times where we have to we have to sleep on it, and there's still times we have to actually go forward. We actually have to have hard conversation, and we have to actually examine development plans or transportation plans, or even just how families and communities relate as like a, a family relationship unit before we we get our our work done. It's it's so powerful, and I I think it's uh, there's some trends that I really pick up on in that narrative where you, I think, you know, the importance of having different kinds of people at the table together, I I think is something that I sincerely believe in, but I wonder if you could talk about why you find that to be so important. It's because we are, we're all human in a, in a lot of ways. And I feel like sometimes in our pursuit of a greater happiness for ourselves, we often feel like, oh, well, our happiness has to come at the expense of someone else. Or, oh, our budget only allows for us to do this one thing. Or, oh, we these people are promising us jobs. We have to spend the millions or else they won't ever come back. Instead of, you know, well, what if we spent those millions and gave it to like, the smaller businesses that already have put out a shingle and who've already proven themselves, you know, like in the entrepreneurial world, we talk about minimum viable products. There are a lot of folks with minimum viable products sitting in their basement, sitting in their spare room, sitting in a homeless shelter, and all they need is just that little boost, and boom, they are a pillar of your community uh, once they're able to produce things, or sometimes it's just not production at all. Sometimes it's just being a keeper of stories or being a keeper of recipes or you know, making sure our bellies are full and happy, making sure that we are... We feel, we feel happy. I mean, I think we all want to be happy and healthy. And so being happy and healthy also includes, you know, the idea that when we see each other out and about, when we interact with each other out and about, we make sure that we don't uh, preclude people from being able to be happy and healthy. Hmm. Well, a lot of that seems to come down to very basic relationship building that we need to be able to trust and kind of shift how we perceive value in some of our communities that that we can find value in places that we don't often think of finding value and that uh, perhaps our investment would be better served in pursuing non kind of traditional value statements. Is that is that something that would resonate with you? Oh, absolutely. Even though I feel like we, we say it's not traditional, but really in a lot of ways we're coming back and we're building on traditions that some groups have had and others may have abandoned or, you know, that may, there may be some newness in the, in these new value, in these value statements, but ultimately the goal is to be more inclusive, to be, I guess, just to not be cruel to people. You know, on the surface, just whatever you're doing, if it, if you're causing people pain and anguish, then, yeah, that's just, that's, I would say, where you would start at, you know? Hmm. Well, I think that one of the other powerful narratives that I kind of, when I hear you talk about this, is that uh, moving from, like, a, a, a what are the problems and what are the issues to how how are those problems or issues even how can we view them as assets or how can we move to a positive way of thinking about these differences and these uh, these issues if you were to say uh, in our communities that to, to really move I think as you mentioned in your talk here last year from a from a uh, why should we do this to a why shouldn't we do this perspective oh yeah absolutely why why shouldn't we you know I what a what a time that I can think of when doing that was positive and really listening to people is I was when I was working in Birmingham, Alabama last year or a, a a park plan and there was a young man who came to one of our meetings and on the card all he wanted was just a skate park and there was you know just something like that that is something that we may have not thought about because oftentimes you know we don't always engage uh, teenagers, you know, in some places, you know, we basketball courts are read a certain way in some places. Uh, it's been skate parks and, and D.C. especially. It's been go-go. It, you know, it's been certain art forms that are graffiti or some certain art forms that have been read as negative in some places. Yet in other places, all of a sudden, it's 
it's a wonderful thing and, you know, the money has been put behind it and the support's been put behind it. And you stop and you actually talk to people who create these art forms and you find out why they create them. And that, you know, it's not necessarily their presence that makes negative behaviors happen around these things. Sometimes it's just people, again, who bring other issues to their, to their daily lives and they bring them to their daily lives in a very public space. Yeah, and so, I mean, it's, I think one of the trends that, again, comes out and that really resonates through that statement is just the, the need to create belonging in some ways and that everyone feels like uh, they belong in that community and that community accepts them as they are and that we we can, uh, f- I think that's a huge part of feeling at home in a place, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. If, you, if you're walking down the street and you're getting stared at and you can tell that you're being stared at, or if you walk up to a, if you're at a networking function and you walk up to a group and you try to at least say hello, how are you? And you're listening to the conversation and you're bouncing around from group to group and you can't find a, a, a cluster of people you can relate to, that definitely affects you. Uh, on the macro level, when you're starting to see your rents rise and you wonder why, you know, there's not really been any changes in your space, like the living space, but you know, you go to your your lease renewal and things are different. Uh, when you when you see restaurants change or when restaurants, you know, they are pushed out and one comes back and, it, again, the food is higher, same kind of food, you know, it's definitely not very positive. And in some ways it's positive that there's new energy coming into an area. I don't want us to think that just in the, in the sort of sake of, tradition and preservation, everything needs to stay the same. No, change is positive and change is good, but is change necessary in a situation? I think we, when we're thinking about making sure people belong and when we're thinking about wanting to make positive change, we should definitely ask the question, is this positive, is this a net positive for everyone that's here? Does this lift up everybody? And yes, if, if my ultimate goal is to make this a uh, really capitalistic, extremely uh, money-producing enterprise, am I in the right place, or should I take a step back and think about how wealth and how value can be generated in other forms besides dollars? Hmm. Well, it sounds like you're you're really advocating for a people first way of thinking about this that instead of thinking about you know what's good for the city or what's good for this company or what's good for this community even that uh, we think about what's good for the people first and that's thinking I would imagine you would say that's thinking both individually and uh, on a community level about the people but making sure that those are that's where we think about that we when we make decisions we think about what's good for those people is that uh, does that resonate for you Oh, absolutely. And, you know, I think that we can have even more sophisticated conversations about growing a community and adding value and adding wealth and adding new resources to a community. But I think you have to have that conversation after you've made sure everything is taken care of. It's it's basically the Maslow's Triangle. You have to have the basic needs met. And then you can talk about the self-actualization and, you know, that's true on an individual level. It's also true on a neighborhood level. Mm-hmm. And I think we would have more buy-in for new community projects because everybody likes new and shiny. You know, there's a some people like, you know, classic things. Other things, people like new things. And a lot of people like the mixture of the classic and the new. And I think that's what it takes. You know, you, you want to come in and you want to talk about new things, but it's why does it have to be expensive somebody else getting pushed to the side? Hmm. Well, I think that that, uh, so the question that raises in my mind is how do we then as a community create systems and, and a culture that uh, focuses on creating belonging as opposed to creating uh, new capital or, or so how do we focus on that social capital as opposed to the, the physical and, and built capital in some ways? So have you? I know you've done a bunch of work. Do you have any kind of suggestions on how best to structure communities so that it focuses around that issue of belonging? Well, I like when planners, especially people who work in city planning or even if you've been contracted by a city or an entity to go into a community, really go into that community and ask what they like to do or look at their calendar 
and look at events that you could come to and hang out at. You know, a lot of communities do these great, wonderful neighborhood festivals, and so they've already sort of learned how to bring community out in the a lot of times in the way that you want to, especially if you're bringing in a new food business or bringing in a new entertainment venue of some sort. Uh, you have to be patient with people, especially if all they've ever been done, all that's ever been done to them is that you show up at their community institution or you make them go to a meeting and say, oh, well, we created this plan in our book. We're going to do this plan. We're going to slap it on you. And, oh, we might be able to change maybe 10% of it because you don't like it. But most 90% of this is going to get built unless if you like it or not. We really need to stop that because, again, there are a lot of communities that have been aching and wanting new resources and new things. There are a lot of communities that do want housing. But how can you do that in a way that actually provides wealth that stays in the community, that it's a mutual benefit arrangement. You know, it's not necessarily taking all of your wealth away from you, but are you willing to sacrifice a little bit of your wealth such that others can have it as well? Uh, And then can we also think about including all ages and all stages? Uh, I know a lot of times because of budgeting and because of time constraints, we don't often get to uh, call up all the stakeholders we need. Uh, we don't have the time to nurture stakeholders, especially when we're talking about uh, younger, the younger generation sometimes, especially when we're talking about populations that don't necessarily speak English as their first language, uh, populations, again, who've been traumatized by these types of uh, community processes and who are like, again, who are you coming to in my neighborhood? Why do I need something new? Why can't you just let me be, you know? So it, there's a balance. And there's, there may just be the need to build in more time in the budgeting process to make sure we nurture communities. Uh, and then also just planning for actually, when we're, we're doing our long-range planning, actually planning for whatever is going to happen to happen, especially if it is a positive outcome. And also reassessing whether or not the community needs that. And also building in things, you know, really looking at the work that's been done with what's been called in the industry tactical urbanism. Now, thinking about those temporary things, those things that you can just sort of make happen in a day's time or an hour's time that creates the kind of community and even sometimes the kind of commerce that you want. Hmm. So really trying to, uh, I, th- I think what I'm hearing in some degree is that we need to both empower those people, but also create ways that the whole community can kind of see a new imaginative while understanding um, that, that there needs to be new investment and the changes, you know, balancing that very real need for investment with the very real need for people to feel a sense of ownership in these projects. And that, as you say, it, I think time often plays a bigger role than we think in that conversation in terms of, uh, you know, grant cycles and reporting and those things that really, I think, uh, one of the things that resonated for me in there was that the idea of just hanging out in these communities and being part of these festivals instead of, uh, and it, well, not instead of, but in addition to the more traditional um, have a meeting, invite people to the meeting and have stakeholder conversations, but just being present and, and having relationships built. Again, it comes back, I think, to that thinking people first there. Oh, yeah. It, yeah, definitely, definitely keeping people first. But I also want people who, even, even in spite of the trauma of losing things, and in spite of the trauma of not knowing, you know, setting goals and dreams can still happen. You know, not, and also recognizing that what we call the American dream over the past 50, 60, 70 years should look very different and should be different for everyone else. Again, there are things that can be done to facilitate certain common dreams, but that common vision is a lot bigger than what we've been saying for many, many years. Uh, Honestly, there are a lot of people with the original vision that are very problematic. You know, it's definitely a a sprawl creation that's a that's a drag on our environmental resources. Uh, again, a lot of those neighborhoods were uh, restricted by race or restricted by income in a lot of ways, and that's not a that's not really a positive activity because again, one person's dream of owning a home has been restricted for generations. One person's dream of maintaining a business 
or being able to handle a small small community business or, you know, preserve a class of family recipe or sell art or, you know, be a, a musician or, you know, so create, you know, code a new app of some sort, you know, just how can we enable dream making and dream creation for all kinds of people? And, you know, and of course, it's positive dream making, you know, positive growth oriented dream making of people of all types of shapes. And even the ones whose needs haven't always been met, but can we meet those needs so that they can do that so that we can have higher level conversations? But we're still not at the level in a lot of communities where we can even think about higher level conversations. Uh, we can't even, sometimes we can't encourage folks to dream. And I think that's horrible because everybody should be able to use their imagination and feel like that they can, things can happen to them that are, are happier. Hmm. So what, how would you, if you were in a place that's having trouble with that, how do you go about encouraging people to think creatively again in a way that if they haven't done that in a long time or to embrace imagination in a way that they haven't done in a while? How, how do you do that? I, I would definitely solicit uh, practitioners, you know, therapists, people who are really skilled at thinking about how the brain processes activity. And again, I would budget in the time to sort of sit in meetings and have people either write out their frustration or even scream it into a microphone. You know, I would honestly set up sound booths at some of our um, hmm. public meetings. Because oftentimes, you know, people go up and they, they're often asked to do this at a podium in front of like a, a line of people who are supposedly in positions of power. And, you know, there's the meetings going all day and all night. And sometimes people still can't come to the meeting and they're still just frustrated. But, you know, if you set up like some sort of a, a phone loop and, you know, the people who have to stay up all night and listen to this are actually the people who have the stakeholder to decision makers. And so, you know, we, we make it easier for people to express their concerns. We open up it, open up the door for people to say what they are concerned about and what makes them troubled. And then we go from there and we, we read through and we determine or not whether or not people are ready for the next step. And then sometimes, you know, it's it's getting a community mentally healed from trauma and recognizing that there's trauma there. And then once the, the trauma has passed, then you can think about, you know, building something. But again, obviously, this is a long-term project. This isn't a project for people who want to build an apartment building in 18 months and hope that and know that a certain amount of people will pay the premium to live there and that they will, it'll sort of be the get-rich-quick scheme. This isn't a get-rich-quick scheme. This is definitely establishing a, a generational a community wealth that will take longer than just a few weeks. And, you know, it, it's definitely an, an investment that needs to happen. It's a, these investments do need to happen. But, again, not only do you have to be ready as a, a, a community maker, builder, healer, whatever, you have to also, the community, again, still may not be ready to ever accept you. But you you have to process as a start. And, again, there, there are folks who are ready to have different conversations, but we, you often have to meet them where they are. I think that resonates a ton for me. There was a project that I worked on for a couple of years, and it, uh, after many conversations, it just wasn't the right time. And so we've shelved it, and I still think it's the right path forward, but I'm not going to push it because I don't, uh, the community either isn't ready for it or maybe it's not the right idea. And just, uh, I think that. Mm -hmm that's not an easy thing to come to once you've invested some ego and, and some of yourself into something. But I, it's uh, having that uh, willingness to listen, I think, is a crucial thing here. And that when we have these conversations, it's not just to so someone you can check the box. It's so that you can really listen and that everything that you come to the table with is open for conversation. I think it's uh, that's a very scary thing, I understand, for a lot of people, but I think it's, uh, hearing what you say, I think it's a crucial component of that. Yeah, it, again, it, it's people-focused design. It's the type of design I want to practice. And, 
even in my own practice and my own work, you know, I it takes me a while these days to write blog posts. I'm definitely switching gears and looking at writing whole books on certain things because it's just things that take a lot of time to marinate and think about. You know, if you'd asked me these questions, say, two years ago, I may have not had the same answer and had the right answer. Who's to say that I won't revise that answer two years from now? And I also have known what it's like to have personal grief um, and, and losing a parent and losing someone that's very close to me who inspired a lot of my work on in this area. And, you know, what do you do next? Uh you know, the, the home that we grew up in, it's just no longer, I grew up in, it's no longer there. So, you know, what what do I make of that? A lot of uh, restaurants that I grew up going to, some have moved on. Some of them owners have passed away. Uh, you know, I've lost, I've lost high school and college classmates. Because, uh, again, you know, it's, the world keeps spinning, and there are things that happen that we can't always help. Uh and you, you cannot you can't definitely can't control everything and everybody. But I have tried to focus at least in my personal practice and in my personal life, focus on the things that I can't control, focus on the, the things that I can be thankful for and really work on the gratitude practice. And again, I definitely felt like you have to be rooted in a a practice of learning and thinking about the insight of a person in a community before you can make big changes and make those, make lasting changes, especially. Especially if you, you plan on being an institution in the community. We'd like to take a moment now to say thank you to our sponsors today. The Urban Affairs and Planning Program at Virginia Tech School of Public and International Affairs offers an interdisciplinary approach to understanding planning and policy for mega regions, cities, suburbs, and rural regions in the U.S. and abroad. UAP faculty have expertise in urban planning, architecture, urban design, economics, geography, political science, law, technology, and engineering, and provide students with a multifaceted understanding of how communities grow and change. Students apply their knowledge and professional skills by participating in real-world problem-solving with community clients through project-based studios and applied research. UAP emphasizes technical analysis and policy evaluation in approaching the complexities of modern communities. So a big thanks today to the Urban Affairs and Planning Program down at Virginia Tech for being our sponsor. If you'd like to hear more, check them out online. But without further ado, we'll get back to today's guest. Thank you. Well, that's uh, that's something that certainly came out in your talk last year. Just the the need to spend time in the shoes of others, and that we all uh, need to have an appreciation for where other people are coming from and where their perspectives are now, and where they have been, and where uh, where they may go in the future. Mm-hmm. Well, now you mentioned there um, your blog posting, and I, I wondered if you could talk a bit about why you think you found it important to share your work and to share your message and that why uh, you think it's important to have communication channels open like that? Well, I, again, I'm a, my undergraduate degree was in communication, but even before then I've been writing, writing stuff since I could write. I really since kindergarten I was encouraged to write stories and make stories and literally my first story was about the adventures of the jams and jellies that live in the cabinet and the in the refrigerator in the kitchen. And it definitely I had teachers and I had my parents encouraging me to use my imagination and actually write these things down. So naturally the pen has been where I started with a lot of things and of course moving from the pen to the keyboard and using both in tandem. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if I'm thinking about a quick the quickest way to solve something, even if it's just something basic as, you know, how much do I need to buy at the store? Like I open up my no- notebook that I have and I've custom built my journal to have a calendar in it and sections of pages mm-hmm. and I can take pages in and out of it. And it's, it's it's about size, but just a little bit bigger, and it's in a, in a, in a, a ring binder, and just just getting the things out of my brain, because a lot of ideas are coming across my brain, and so 
that was the, just the basicness of using writing as a platform. And again, I've always been fascinated in how people tell stories and how to refine my story and how to use com- channels of communication to tell stories. So that led me to being a communication major and doing that at a school no more for its engineering and its communication major probably, but we do actually graduate more communication majors hmm. uh, some years at NC State. So, but it's, it's a technical, sort of a technical focus that sort of marries the changing technologies of the world with having so many people who are engaged in being at the front lines of the, you know, what was in the industrial and then into the, the technical revolution we've had over the years. Obviously with social media, that's a clear place where the two have married and how stories often get released on pe- people pull out their phones that are computers and then they tell stories and they record audio and then they shoot it out through these social media and they record, you know, they type out things, they, they write down things, they, they scribble things in notebooks and they photograph it and then they shoot it out. You know, this, this what we're doing right now is going to go out through the internet. So just understanding the role of technology and the role of, of storytelling in that sense. And then just that, you know, op- making observations of what's going on around me in my community. Again, literally it sometimes just comes down to, well, why can't I get this particular fish anymore? Why can't this restaurant be open this amount of time a day? Why can't we live, you know, again, with my parents splitting up, I literally asked, you know, why can't we look closer as a family unit? anymore. So a lot of the, the things that have happened in my life, I've seen them in a very spatial uh, perspective, but my the quickest way that I could get a message out, obviously, is through the wit- written word and through communication channels. And so that's why it's been writing. And of course, having also had a little bit of marketing and branding instilled in me, or at least talked to me when I was mm-hmm. in my, um, in my uh, undergraduate program, when I get to my graduate program and I'm reading about all these different uh, policy prescriptions and things that have happened over the years, I'm like, okay, well, I'm writing this. At first, it was, my original blog was called Waxing Philosophical. I decided, okay, let me take that Waxing Philosophical idea and let me tell people blatantly that I am a black urbanist, like a, a black person who likes the urban environment, and let me use that as my platform and my sort of calling card. Over And there have been times over the years I'm like, is this too much? You know, am I, am I drawing too much attention to myself? Should I just shrink back? Should I be, you know, unfortunately, there's no really better word to say than whitewashing myself. But as of right now, I realize, you know, you cannot deny who you are as a person especially not in a, in a craft like mine where directly I'm getting the idea in my brain and putting it on the paper and it's coming directly from me without, with me, how my eyes and my ears and my mouth interpret what is put into it and shown to it. Hmm. Well, I think, you know, it's clear to me why you, that, uh, you need to add that part about yourself being black to the title urbanist. But I wonder um, if someone were to ask you why um, it's important for you to lay those out together, what, how would you explain that to them? Well, often, because again, I come from a communication studies background. You know, if you're the radio format, often what, what we call urban radio is really just black music. And so I... Oftentimes, I would start to notice people using urban as an euphemism for black. And not to say that there's anything wrong with being a, a black person from the inner city or actually using the terminology inner city in certain respects. I'm very proud of the fact that I live in the middle of Washington, D.C., and I lived in the middle of Greensboro, North Carolina, and I lived on campus in the middle of Raleigh, North Carolina, and lived in the middle of Kansas City, Missouri for a brief period of time. And so having lived these places and having, you know, enjoying what it means to be in the middle of something, you know, that's what inner city life means to me at, at this point in stage. And it, yes, there have been, it has been associated with trouble. And again, that goes back to policy, the policies that have created the ghettos that we had that have made the inner city be bad. So 
I really wanted to reinstill pride in the name and the title of Urban as it's associated with blackness. You know, I when I think of, you know, urban life and blackness, I think about, you know, all the different African countries that have brought their culture, who have the, those of us who were descendants of enslaved folks who managed to maintain a bit of our African culture as we've come over through the Middle Passage, you know, to and be able to maintain that through the Great Migration and the re-migration that's happening, the back and forth between the North and the South and the East and the West and all over the world, the first and second generations of folks coming from the African continent and the African countries, you know, even the folks who came over who went to the what we consider Latin America and have come to this country who have all these all these different lineages. Again, it's about affirming the positivity of of blackness. It's also affirming that, of course, Black Lives Matter. It's about affirming, you know, that Black urban lives matter, no matter what. Form they come in, and also black suburban lives matter, and black rural lives matter. Everybody matters in how and how we live, and it's not that we matter at the expense of other people. But even before that statement became in the mainstream, I wanted to affirm that blackness and urbanism were not oxymorons and were not mutually exclusive, and also po- both positive and expression. Hmm. What a powerful perspective. Um. Thank you for sharing that. I, I wonder if you've been doing this. How long has the Black Urbanist been going on now? It'll be seven years in October. Okay, so that's you know a significant period of time. Uh, what have you learned? What have kind of been the one or two biggest things that you've learned during your time doing that? I've learned that I have to, you know, obviously a lot of what I've say, said on this uh, program this afternoon, people definitely have something to say about it. And they may or may not like it, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's not true and that it's not the truth that I've known and seen. Uh, I've also had to learn that, you know, people people bring their own baggage to situations. I've also had to learn that I've kid, I have to be conscious of who I am as a person. I have to be kind to myself in addition to being kind to others. I have to take time and relax. I can't jump into every movement that happens. Uh, I probably haven't done as much as I, I like to on um, the issues around police brutality. I want the folks who are on the front line of that movement, of that part of the movement, to know that I'm there for them. But I've also seen, especially because I think about things spatially, how important it is to talk about the spatial injustices, the environmental injustices that have happened in the black community and in some respects the Latina community and other other marginalized communities. I would even say in Appalachia, you know, we, we often don't talk about that as well, how a lot of the roots of folks who have resentment, especially on racial lines, come from the fact that, you know, there was a community that had an economy and that economy was taken. You know, people who black Americans who were forced out of homes, that was taken. So, you know, saying things like this is not going to grant me friends in some circles, but it will grant me friends and others. And the friends that I have from speaking speaking my truth are friends that I can count on, friends and family that I can count on from years to come. And, you know, I also have had to tell myself just because I have this consciousness doesn't mean I can't function, say, in a more capitalistic society. I can't I can make money. I can use that money and channel that money to help people rise up because we have to. Like, we have to make the point to help bring people up. People can't climb up. Like, even just the, the, the imagery of the bootstraps just doesn't make sense. Like, if you try to imagine in your head, you, yes, you can quote unquote bootstrap in a way, certain way in the tech world, but even that has limits. You, I, I want to be that person that encourages people to live their dreams. I want them to use whatever means that are available to them to make those dreams happen. But again, ultimately, I have had to learn that, you know, I can say these things and not want cruelty, abject poverty, and abject just uh, disregard for the best of people to happen. And again, it literally comes down to just growing, learning how to grow a bigger skin 
learning how to protect like the core of me, the things that I do share with the world, keep some things for myself, and then let some things be public and be a, a teaching lesson. Hmm. Well, what it, it's uh, it's not easy. I have to say, I, I'm uh, so thankful for you being willing to talk about these things and being willing to share your perspective. And it's so powerful, uh, and just your experiences and being willing to uh, so open about them and being willing to to share them with a broad audience that and know that you're going to get negative feedback, but to continue to do so, I think is uh, really brave. And I, I thank you for continuing to do so, and thank you for taking the time today. Uh, and as we kind of come to a close, I wonder if you could share a story um, that kind of encapsulates what you think uh, community should be or um, what in your travel, something that has shown you the power of community or just just uh, something that encapsulates your thought as, as best you as you want to share it. You know, I've always loved festival days at home in Greensboro. I, my dad and I, when we still did, when they still did city stage, and I I know that there's a form of that that still happens in the festival community, but just waking up, uh, oftentimes, especially with the, with NCAAC homecoming, you know, there was a parade involved, going and hearing the music, hearing all the marching bands, and then you leave that, and in that case, you leave and you go to the tailgating lot, you go to a game, and you might go to a festival that happens, like a smaller festival, but the downtown, when all the streets downtown are blocked off and closed down, when there's, like, people selling puppets on the corner, or, like, offering puppets, now that the food truck revolution is back, you know, when I come back home to those festivals and see the food trucks out and all this different culinary awesomeness, you know, every band in the region of all different types of singing and rapping and praising God or whatever they do, like doing all the different sun salutations and the dances, mm. just everybody is doing their thing. It might be 95 degrees outside, but we're making it happen somehow, <laughs> you know. The heat is not keeping us from coming together as a community. And again, this is something that happens on select days of the year. We go back on the other days and we practice our songs and we make our crafts and we, you know, we, we absorb what we see. And again, you know, sometimes, it, yes, some of the cultural tradition uh, maintaining requires a degree of isolation, but I think that we can also, we can, we can cross paths, we can share, but at the end of the day, just respecting that we all come from a place, we all have a place that we are rooted on, on this globe, and respecting those traditions, especially the ones, again, that don't cause uh, cruelty to people and, and don't cause pain, but yet enhance the environment. So really, it's just being, being outside on festival days. Uh, going to street festivals anywhere, especially the ones we do in Greensboro. And like I said, I hope to hear that next year we don't have any, you know, uh, negative falsifications of any type, anything that could be um, misinterpreted on all sides. And, of course, I I want to say this, and if anybody is listening back home in Greensboro, you know, I don't want this to sound like I'm I'm brushing off issues we've had in the past few years when we have our street festivals, but to just keep having the street festivals and keep working through the ickiness and respecting everybody and their rights to be out and the rights to street that everybody has. Well, you've certainly energized me to want to go out to the next street festival here in Roanoke. So I'll have to check the calendar and see what that is. Uh, but thank you so much for taking the time today, Kristen. I really appreciate your willingness to continue to share your message and, and to continue to uh, advocate for um, the needs of the community and the, that perspective that you bring to bear. Um, now, if you all listening would like to hear Kristen's talk from CityWorks Expo last year, you can check out our website, cityworksexpo.com. And thank you again, Kristen, for being here, and I hope that uh, we get to re- reconnect again soon. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I hope that folks will reach out to, you know, me on that Black Urbanist. I also podcast myself with my colleague, Katrina Johnson Zimmerman. Uh, we're at Third Wave Urban on all the social networks. Absolutely. And I've listened. You guys should all check that out. It's absolutely wonderful. So thank you again, Kristen, and we'll end it there. Thank you for listening to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast today. 
If you like what you hear, please subscribe and leave a rating. It really helps other people find out about our fascinating guests and find the information that we have to share. Lastly, please save the day for our upcoming event, October 5th through 7th in Roanoke, Virginia. And keep up to date by following us on Facebook and checking out our website, cityworksexpo.com. That's cityworksxpo.com. Thank you guys again and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.